it was the day of the ginger yesterday in Wellington because Ed Sheeran played the Opera House last night and Chris Hipkins, he got sworn in as Prime Minister. The era of Jacinda Ardern, or Saint Jacinda as she's soon going to be called, it is over. The deed is done. And uh, the Labour Party hopes and is now leaking its polling to stuff because the polling shows that he might just lift their fortunes a little bit. And, of course, the narrative now from the woke left media is that it's game on, that um, Chris Hipkins has turned the ship around or is going to turn the ship around. The other, other interesting thing about the polling, the Horizon Research polling that's come out, is it does very clearly say that those who who were polled, the thing they are most concerned about is the economy, is the cost of living, inflation and the like. I do not know the methodology they used for that. Um, it is not surprising. But my question is, and I guess what we explore on the platform is, is that really the issue? And I have jokingly said over the last couple of days that if Chris Hipkins wants to win the next election, all he's got to do is go to Television New Zealand, Radio New Zealand and 3 News and tell them to stop using Māori words in the weather and then say that he's done that. And I think that would make a whole lot of middle New Zealanders much more comfortable about their world and might even win Labour the election. But there are other issues here. And clearly with uh, events at Ratna the day before yesterday... The issue of ethnicity, of the place of the Treaty of Waitangi in New Zealand's uh, constitutional framework, and the issue of, of what ACT are calling the ethno-state, where your parentage or your lineage will differentiate how much democracy you get and how far up, for example, a hospital waiting queue you are, is very much a live issue, though the Horizon Research poll doesn't suggest that it is. Um, if it wasn't, we wouldn't have had a change of leadership. If it wasn't, we wouldn't have had the debate and outrage over the actions of, for instance, Tanaya Mahuta. And if it wasn't, Three Waters wouldn't be the huge issue it is in many, many parts of the country. Chris Hipkins has signalled though not being explicit, that maybe we might modify some of the uh, issues around the treaty and around co-governance. But is that genuine? And what do we need to look for for real change, if that indeed is what you want? Well, I think a great person to talk about this issue, though I know people will scream at me for having them on the programme because that's just the woke world we live in. Uh, is Don Brash, former leader of the National Party, forward, former govern, governor of the Reserve Bank, um, and also involved in the organisation Hobson's Pledge, which talks about issues of co-governance and of the treaty and of race in New Zealand. And uh, Don Brash, I'm pretty sure, is online and joins us now. Don, welcome to the programme. How are you? Good morning, John. Very well indeed. Thank you. All right. Uh, Don, firstly, what do you make of the signals that have come out of Prime Minister uh, Chris Hipkins uh, since it was clear he was going to take the top job? Do you think Labor is modifying its position on the sort of issues that you're interested in? Well, he may be. He certainly, I think, has used the word New Zealand a couple of times when perhaps his predecessor might have used the word Aotearoa. And that in itself may be significant, because I think you're right. A lot of New Zealanders are just fed up with minor things like the use of te reo, where they expect to see in hear English being used. And it may well be that he is indeed changing the emphasis a little bit there. Uh, if so, uh, that could win him some brownie points. All right. But what, to your mind, would be needed to say it's real change rather than... Uh, if you like, signal change or, or the perception of change? Oh, I don't think he really can make really substantive change. I mean, he's got a very strong Maori caucus there, which until now at least has been calling the shots in a whole range of areas. I mean, take healthcare, for example. 
we're told that the reason that Maori New Zealanders die slightly younger than other New Zealanders is because the health system is racist. Therefore, we have to have a different health system for Maori than from other New Zealanders. Now, that is bolder than actually the first order. Chinese New Zealanders live longer than European New Zealanders. It doesn't suggest that the health system is preferring Chinese New Zealanders, the whole range of things which affect life expectancy. Uh, three waters you mentioned. Uh, I mean, to abandon the current direction that Labour is going in would mean fundamental change to three waters, and I just can't see any chance of Chris Hipkins uh, going there. Uh, the, ho the whole range of areas which, which the Labour government is tracking down on this racial issue, based on the assumption that those who have a Maori ancestor, always, of course, now with other ancestors as well, have some kind of preferential constitutional status because of the treaty. Now, that's a gross... Uh, misinterpretation of the treaty and as we've seen from both uh, Jacinda Ardern and Chris Hipkins they don't understand the treaty at all you recall just shortly after uh, the Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern became Prime Minister she went to Waitangi asked what the first article of the treaty said and she hadn't a clue I mean it's a one-page document very very simple document and she had mumbled something about partnership well the word partnership does not appear in the treaty or no, any synonym for the word partnership does, nor does, doesn't appear in the treaty either. Chris Hipkins wasn't too sure what Article 3 was about. Article 3 is a fundamental yet we part have of the treaty. Don, yet we have, Don, for example, uh, published by New Zealand On Air, the treaty guideline for media organisations, which has That's way right. more than one yeah. page of, of guidance and says that... Um, uh, news media organisations have to recognise that Maori never ceded sovereignty, that we live in a racist post-colonial world and we, we must construct essentially two systems of government. Can, and that's deep if you like in our public service, that's not just in broadcasting and woke organisations like New Zealand On Air. And I guess my question is, Surely for real change, it's going to take more than a Prime Minister standing up at a press conference not saying Aotearoa every 30 seconds. It's going to take getting inside the public service and the bureaucracy and in some ways weeding out this madness. Well, I think uh, unless the ACT Party is right, there's a fundamental discussion to be had. What did the treaty say? Now, for 140-something years... Everyone's understood that the treaty involved Maori's uh, uh, chiefs ceding sovereignty. In return, their, their property rights being guaranteed. And thirdly, everyone having equal rights. That was the interpretation of the treaty, which was universally held. And indeed, even after the, uh, the, the, the Court of Appeal decision in 1987, which talked about something being akin to a partnership, uh, there was no serious challenge to the idea that Maori chiefs had, so uh, had ceded sovereignty. You recall in 2014, I think, the Waitangi Tribunal said that Napui hadn't ceded sovereignty. And Chris, Chris uh, Finlayson, who, of course, uh, is regarded as someone who's sympathetic to Maori claims, I think replied uh, bollocks or something equally uh, mm. blunt. Uh, so this is an, a new interpretation of the treaty. Not only uh, have we um, been in, in assuming that Maori chiefs ceded sovereignty, every New Zealander, including Maori New Zealanders, has been behaving as if they did. They've served in the police force, served in the army, they've paid their taxes, accepted benefits from the state. Everyone's assumed that the Crown is sovereign uh, until suddenly a group of radicals are trying to say, no, no, they didn't. It's a different sovereignty completely. So it's a serious issue and I think it requires serious debate. Um, talking of radicals, um, I just wondered, and you would have dealt with her, I imagine, the passing of Titifai Harawera. Yes, indeed. Uh, that, uh, <laughs> yeah, mixed feelings, um, uh, Sean. I mean, she was a dangerous person in many respects. I had a few contacts with her, uh, some of them quite cordial contacts. Uh, but uh, her view of the treaty clearly is radically different from mine. Uh, I, I think um, she uh, perpetrated the view that this that sovereignty had not been ceded and therefore uh, things followed from that. So, uh, but her passing, of course, though it's a significant event in, in Maoridom, I suspect, uh, doesn't fundamentally change the debate. The debate is, is, has to be joined and has to be won. Because let's face it, if we have two nations within the borders of what we used to call New Zealand, 
uh, we, we, we're done for. There is no future in New Zealand if we have two different peoples with two different ideas of sovereignty. Mm. Uh, it would seem to me, though, and I think Chris Hipkins has admitted this as an issue by saying that maybe we haven't been clear about co-governance and then he goes to Ratna and makes maybe different noises. But equally, in the National Party, we do not seem to have a, a major opposition party, Don, that is wants to grapple with this issue either. I mean, all I seem to hear from Chris Luxon is that he's learning to Rayo and that, oh, the Māori seats are OK, and he's trying to have no position on this at all. Uh, well, I mean, I've been disappointed that he hasn't been stronger than he has been, but let's face it, he did go to Ratna and say, we want no part of co-governance in public services. Now, he has said that before, but to say that Ratna was quite a significant event, I think. Uh, he did say that quite clearly and quite strongly, and I, I welcome that very much. Um, now, he did leave open, of course, the possibility of co-governance in treaty settlements, and, and he had to do that because that's what national, the national government of John Key did with, with the whole range of things. Uh, I think those have not worked well in many cases, and I guess the, the Auckland Volcanic Cones is one example of a co-governance organisation officially representing both Maori and uh, the wider public, and that's effectively being run by a bunch of Maori chiefs or Maori tribes anyway, yeah. uh, and not very satisfactory from the point of view of most Aucklanders. Mm. So, Don, what would a debate on these issues look like? Well, I, th I think we would have to say, has was sovereignty ceded in 1840? Um, well, who's, who gets to say that, then, though? Who, who gets to say that? Well, that that's kind of my question. Well, I mean, I, I think we have to look at the text of the treaty, uh, and and uh, in my view, it is absolutely unambiguous. Uh, you also have to look at the speeches made by Maori chiefs at that time. Some of them said, "We want no part of this because it means that the Queen would have authority over us. We don't want that." But uh, nevertheless, signed in most cases. A few didn't, but most did. Um, mm. They understood at the time that they were asked to cede sovereignty to a higher authority. Why would they do that? Because, um, of course, in the preceding two or three decades, there'd been awful slaughter uh, in the musket wars with, with tens of thousands of people being being killed. Um, that's why they did it. And I'd be a bit yeah. afraid of the French as well. But, I mean, the, the reasons for doing it, I think, are pretty clear. Yeah. Oh, look, look, I come back to, though, Don, we have had words of a change of direction from, from you know, the Beehive Theatre end. We're, yeah, from yep. Hipkins. Maybe we've had some movement because he's had to get off his bum from Luxon. Okay, and maybe he's being more defined. But have you seen anything in terms of a policy or an addressing of the separatist agenda in so much, so much of our public service, including the new health system, the reformed health system. Have you actually seen or can you see any real change on the horizon? No, I can't. I, the likelihood of them actually going back, for example, on the health system we mentioned earlier, I mean, that is now baked in concrete as far as the government's concerned. They, they simply could not say, look, we made a ghastly mistake. All New Zealanders are treated equally in the health system. We're scrapping the Maori Health Authority. That isn't going to happen. So as long as we keep building institutions which are separate for those who have a Maori ancestor, uh, we're on the wrong track. Yeah. Um, all right, Don, in general terms, uh, you've been in politics. You know what leadership changes <laughs> and things are. And I just want to draw on your, your perspective uh, I think we were kind of sold a pup that suddenly the Prime Minister came back after Christmas, had no gas in the tank and everything changed. Chris Hipkins has kind of admitted he knew before Christmas it was a pretty smooth transition that had clearly been worked on in the weeks over the holidays. Do you think, what's your political assessment of whether or not this gives, and just let's be brutal about it, gives Labour a chance to be re-elected come October? 
Uh, I don't think they will be re-elected come October. I think the change has, in fact, slightly improved their prospects, uh, precisely for the kind of, of reason we talked about. It's a different face. Uh, there was a degree of, of hatred of, of the Prime Minister for reasons which were not entirely uh, decent, in my view. Uh, but the basic policy settings of this government haven't changed and seem very unlikely to change. Yes, they'll abandon a few things, perhaps the Radio New Zealand, uh, Burka, TVNZ, merger may be dropped yeah. and a few other things. Can you see them but rolling the back three waters, issue. Don? No, I can't. I simply can't. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, may t- 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 tweak it at the margin perhaps, but that, that is that is baked in, well, the law's passed already. Um, mm. So we're on track to, to implement that thing and, and the National, of course, has promised to, to scrap it. Uh, and, and I think, uh, I don't see the government uh, changing that. Yeah. And whilst we have There's polling out today, Don... Well, today that says it's the economy, it's interest rates, it's cost of living that people are really worried about. I'm kind of surprised at that because I think the fact that Hipkins moved or sent out different signals on issues of the treaty and issues involving Maori, that t- and I'm interested in the feedback you get at Hobson's Pledge and you get through your channels, uh, I've always believed or I've believed that the tensions over these issues are of... I don't know, bipartisanship, co-governance. These really are issues that most New Zealanders have increasingly, have an increasing discomfort over. Yes, that's right. Although I'm about to say uh, we did some polling in Hobson's Pledge indicating that quite a few people thought co-governance sounds nice. It sounds friendly, oh, sounds okay. warm. Uh, yeah, and, and a significant fraction have no idea what it actually means. So while there's a, a significant number also who, who detest it and, and can't abide by it, uh, there's an amazing amount of, of ignorance on the concept and what it actually implies. Mm. Do you think the Prime Minister but was treated my unfairly younger generation. as a woman? Yeah. Uh, do you think the Prime Minister was treated unfairly as a woman that was all misogynist, racist like you that drove her from office? No, I don't. <laughs> I don't. I mean, there was... a. a and no doubt some of that uh, around. Um, some some people can't really abide by the idea of a woman prime minister. But that's, I think, a minority in New Zealand, and a small minority at that. I mean, after all, we had Jenny Shipley and Helen Clark previously, uh, and they weren't uh, noticeably attacked as women. Um, so I don't think there was that significant uh, element of that, to be honest. But there'll be some, for sure. Yeah. Uh, Don, I thank you for your time this morning. It is interesting to see, and I know these are issues you are interested in and and, uh, take an interest in. Um, But I'd just like, if you could to sum up, I get the feeling from you, you think this is largely window dressing and and that no one's prepared to turn this ship around in regards to treaty issues in New Zealand. I think that's absolutely right, Sean. And and uh, the evidence for that is all around us. You talked about the in, is in and on air. I mean, this mm. stuff is deeply embedded in the public sector. Turning it around would yeah. be very difficult uh, under this government. Okay. Is do you? Yeah, but here's my question again: Do you think a national government would actually be any different? Uh, well, a national government with a strong act component would be different. I mean, it's interesting, David Seymour, who, of course, has Napoli ancestry. Or a, himself, or a strong New Zealand affairs component, Don. Winston's well, that, pretty strong right. on this that's stuff. Well, that, that's exactly right. And, of course, both uh, David Seymour and Winston have Napoli ancestry. Uh, and they both want to say, let's treat all New Zealanders as equal. And as you're right, Winston's been strong on this consistently. It's the one issue on which he has been unambiguous. Mm. And do you think Chris Hipkins could be more un- un- unambiguous than he is? Do you think he's being ambiguous now? Uh, well, I do, because he, he he can't move in the kind of way that was required to, to meet the need here. I mean, he's got too strong an uh, investment in New Zealanders being two kinds of people. And, and uh, that, of course, is anathema to, to me and to a great many New Zealanders, but it's what many in the public sector many younger New Zealanders have been taught to believe. Yeah. Hasn't he cast aside the Māori caucus? Doesn't the fact that Carmel Cepeloni, a Pacifica person, as Deputy Prime Minister, Kelvin Davies relegated to some, you know, procedural role as, as Deputy Leader of the Labour Party, isn't that changed on? Uh, 
that, that surprises me, I must say. I expected Kerry Allen to be the deputy, um, but I think she ruled herself out, didn't she? Um, yeah. I mean, it would have been ins un un insufferable if, say, uh, Nanda Mahuta had been the deputy prime minister. That would have sunk their ship absolutely because there's a great deal of antipathy to her personally. And, and, uh, and she, in a sense, epitomizes the sort of two races in New Zealand, Maori and the rest. Um, that would have been a disaster for them. Don, but, I thank but, you for your time. Good. Yeah. You're very uh, welcome. Good talking to you. Appreciate that very that much. Is, okay. That is Don Brash, bye -bye. the uh, former leader of the opposition and, of course, part of Hobson's Pledge. And look, what I get from Don there is that he doesn't think anything really has changed or will change and it's very difficult for the government to turn the boat on these issues round. Um, I'd love to know what you think. 